So the first column is, for which one of these five sets is negative 1 a lower bound? Was it a lower bound for the first set here, the closed interval from 0 to 3? Yes. yes. So negative 1 was a lower bound for this one. How about for the second set? No. no. Third set? Yes. yes. Fourth set? No. no. Fifth set? Yes. yes. So tell me a little bit more about that. What does it mean for negative 1 to be a lower bound? Negative 1 is a lower bound. So we're going to plug in the definition of lower bound here. It's a lower bound for a set S if. So what's the definition here? So writing in words, we would say all the elements of S are greater than or equal to negative 1. So that's the statement verbally. Um, let's reframe it just a little bit using quantifiers. How would I use a quantifier to rewrite what's being said here? All elements of S, how would I write that using a quantified logical proposition? For every, for every what? Right, so we have to give that element a name, so we'll call it x. For every x in this set, then how do we complete that sentence? X is, x is greater than or equal to 1. Right. So we don't want to write there exists because we're not making an existential claim now. We're saying every single x that belongs to the set S has to be greater than or equal to 1. If we follow up, sorry, negative 1, thank you. Um, if we follow that up with a there exists, then we're kind of saying for every x and s, we can associate something else, some other thing, but we don't have to associate. We just have to make the assertion that that x is greater than or equal to negative 1. Um, okay, so this is what it would mean for negative 1 to be a lower bound. What happens if I turn that on its head? For those, for those sets that we did not check yes, let's try and justify that. Negative 1 is not a lower bound if what? So we need to write the negation of this definition. What would the negation of this definition look like? Ah. So if, when, how do you know it's there exists now? That's right, because the definition of lower bound has this universal statement in it for every x in the set. So if we're going to negate that, if we negate a universal quantifier, we end up with an existential quantifier. As Matt says, it only takes one bad apple to spoil the bunch, right? Uh, as soon as we have one example of something for which this does not work, then we have shown that negative 1 is not a lower bound. So we know for every turns into a there exists. So there exists an x in the set such that what? Yeah, such that x is not greater than or equal to negative 1. In other words, x is less than negative 1. So again, gaining practice stating the definition precisely, and then also stating the negation of the definition precisely, super duper helpful, right? Uh, because now we can look at each one of these two statements and ask for a given set, which one of these does it satisfy? Because every set will satisfy one of these or the other. Because every statement whether it's true or false, its negation is going to be the opposite. Right? So if one of these statements is true, then the other one's going to be false and vice versa. So for the set negative infinity comma 4, our second example, how do we know that that set does not have negative 1 as a lower bound? What fits the bill in this uh, negation here? Yeah, for example, negative 2 is an element of S, but it's less than negative 1. So if something does not satisfy the original definition, then it must therefore satisfy the negation, and vice versa. So get some more practice stating precisely the definitions, and also being able to write their opposites, their negations, uh, so that we have a sense of how to either prove or disprove uh, that one or the other is satisfied. What if I change lower bound to upper bound? And now instead of negative 1, we're, I guess, going to think about the number 4. So 4 is an upper bound for S if what? How would I write that? Yeah, all elements of s are less than or equal to 4. 
So for every x in the set, x is less than or equal to 4. So that's the definition of 4 being an upper bound for s. So does our first set meet that criterion? It does. Every element in the first set here, 0, 3, is less than or equal to 4. How about the second set? Second set also meets it. Right? Every element in this set, minus infinity to 4, is less than or equal to 4. Third set? Sure. Fourth set? Also yes. Fifth set? Yeah. After all, every element in the fifth set is an element in the interval from 1 to 4, but it's also only the rational numbers in that interval, right, because of the intersection here. But that part doesn't matter. What matters is that, at least as far as this question goes, what matters is that all those elements are less than or equal to 4. So in fact, all five of these sets satisfy that 4 is an upper bound for them. Um, and none of them satisfy the negation of that definition. Replace the word upper bound with the word maximum. Then what do I have to change here in this definition? What would it mean for 4 to be a maximum element for S? Yeah, so first it has to satisfy the criteria to be an upper bound, right? In order to be a maximum element, all the elements of S have to be less than or equal to 4. But the second piece was the first thing you said, uh, which is that that number, that upper bound, also has to belong to the set. So that's the big thing about maxima and minima, is that uniquely on this page, maxima and minima must be elements of S. They have to actually belong to the set. Right? And so for we a maximum, if for every X and S, x is less than or equal to 4, and uh, maybe I'll put this in front, 4 belongs to s, and for every x in s, x is less than or equal to 4. So of the sets 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, which one, for which ones of them is 4 the maximum element? 2 and uh, Two and four, because we can kind of see directly from the interval notation that four belongs to the set, right? And so if four belongs to the set, then all I have to do is ask, uh, is it an upper bound? And four, in fact, was an upper bound for all five of these sets. So any of these five sets for which four is actually an element, four will also be the maximum element. But why is four not the maximum of the first set? Because it's not an element, yeah. Let's write the negation. 4 is not a maximum of the set if, now let's negate this statement here. Because this original statement has an and in it, if I'm going to negate that, what do I get? What does the and turn into in a negation? Yeah, so it turns into an or. And then I just need to negate each one of the two pieces. So on the one hand, we could have 4 fail to be a maximum because 4 is not an element of S. That's one possibility. The other possibility is to negate the second part of the definition, which we already did a minute ago. There exists uh, an X in S such that X is uh, greater than 4. Right. So there are two possible ways for 4 to fail to be a maximum. One is that 4 doesn't belong to the set at all. The other is that Maybe 4 does belong to the set, but there are also larger elements in the set besides 4. Um, but in fact, 4 not belonging to the set is enough to rule out 4 being a maximum of our first example, and also of our third example, and also of our fifth example. So that was enough in those cases uh, to rule out 4. We can go through the same thought process to ask whether negative 1 is a minimum. Well, we know negative 1 is not going to be a minimum if it's not a lower bound. Right? So for the examples for which negative 1 was not a lower bound, we know negative 1 can't be a minimum. But what's the other thing we need? We also need negative 1 to be an element of the set. Um, and is negative 1 an element? Which one of these sets, 1, 3, and 5, is negative 1 an element of? Did you put any check marks in this column? 
on your sheet? Yeah. Negative 1 is not a minimum of any of these. In two cases, because it clearly, um, uh, in two cases, because it wasn't a lower bound, and in the other three cases, because even though it was a lower bound, it's not an element of the set itself. And minimum and maximum have to be elements of the set. What about infimum and supremum? Let's take, let's sit with four one more time, because four is, uh, we've got a lot more check marks going on for four. So what would it mean for four to be a supremum? <coughs> yes. Supremum means least upper bound. Right? Um, so what's first of all most important about a supremum is that it must be an upper bound. Now, four happens to be an upper bound for all five of these sets. So it doesn't rule anything out right away. But it also has to be the least possible upper bound. There cannot be any upper bounds that are less than four. So let's try and formulate this uh, as precisely as we can. So four is a supremum for s if, first of all, four is an upper bound for s, so that for every x in s, x is less than or equal to four. But we also need to bring in that least part of the, the puzzle. Let me clear us some space. How would we say precisely what it means for 4 to be the least upper bound? So one way of saying that 4 is the least upper bound is to say that if there is any other upper bound for s, then that other upper bound for s has to be greater than or equal to 4. So let's write it this way. For all upper bounds, let's call the upper bound m for the set s, we have m is greater than or equal to 4. So this is the part that makes 4 the least upper bound for the set s. So this is what it would mean for 4 to be the supremum. Um, of these five sets, one through five, which ones of them got your check mark for yes, four is the supremum, the least upper bound? So number two, for sure. Because we said four was an upper bound, but also any other upper bound for this set has to be bigger than four. Um, we can maybe see why in a minute. But I agree with you, number two. How about number three, four least upper bound? Yeah, I think so. Right? Um, if I try and make an upper bound for this third set that's any smaller than 4, what happens? How do I know there's, that there's not a smaller upper bound besides 4 for this set? Yeah, let's, let's try it. Let's just proceed by way of contradiction. So let's suppose m is less than 4, and let's suppose that m is an upper bound. What's the problem with that? Right. We can always find another number between m and 4. How do we know that? Well, with every, everything on here is a subset of the reals. Yeah, so we have a density theorem that we can use. And the density theorem says that there exists some element, let's call it y. In fact, the density theorem would give us a rational number that satisfies this, not that that is going to matter for our argument. But there exists a y which is between m and 4. Why is that a problem? Right. Um, and, and by the way, because y is less than 4, um, y is going to belong to this set, but y is going to be greater than m, and therefore m is not an upper bound for s. Right. So there's a property, an axiomatic property of the real numbers that comes in to save our bacon here. It's what proves for us that 4 is, in fact, the least upper bound.
for this set. Because first of all, 4 is an upper bound, because every element of s is less than 4, less than or equal to 4. Um, but then secondly, any other upper bound cannot be less than 4. Because if I have any number that's less than 4, then I can find a number between it and 4 that belongs to the set s. And therefore, it fails to be an upper bound. Is 4 the least upper bound for the first set, 0, 3? Why not? Yeah, in fact, if we're, going to, if we're going to negate this definition, the negation would read 4 is not the supremum if either 4 is not an upper bound or if there exists. So let's try and, and negate that last little piece. If we turn this part around, it would say there exists an upper bound for s that's less than 4. So what would be an example of an upper bound for this set s that's less than 4? What's an upper bound for the? Yeah, sure, 3. 3 is less than 4 and is also an upper bound for s. Right? So even though 4 was an upper bound, it wasn't the least upper bound because we can find an upper bound that's less. How about for our last set? The open interval from 1 to 4 intersected with the rationals. Is that, does that have 4 as a supremum? For the same reasoning that we had in the, in the third set. Right? We know 4 is an upper bound, but if we try to make an upper bound that's any smaller, we can use this density theorem to say, yes, there's another element of the set that's bigger than that proposed upper bound. Um, and then for the same reason as the second set, the fourth set also has 4 as a supremum. Um, and we can use similar reasoning to guess whether negative 1 is an infimum for these sets. In order to be an infimum, it first has to be a lower bound. So if it wasn't a lower bound, then it can't be an infimum. Um, but then secondly, uh, negative 1 will be the infimum only if it is the greatest lower bound. So we can't have any lower bounds that are greater. It's not the infimum for the first set because 0 is greater than negative 1 is also a lower bound. It's not the infimum for the third set for the same reason, and it's not the infimum of the fifth set for the same reason here using 1. Well, we could even use 0 if we wanted to. 0 is also a lower bound for that set. So negative 1 wasn't the infimum of any. <clears throat>